Hi there, I'm George Marshall from Any Old Music, where we teach and learn from music through analysis and creativity. In my previous video, uh, we took a look at Bizet's second Lali Zen Suite, which was arranged by Ernest Giroux, a close friend and contemporary composer of Bizet. Paying particular attention to the last movement of the work, uh, we analysed Farandola. Uh, in that work, we identified uh, a reliance on the orchestra and larger scale tonal shifts for variety, as well as uh, playing around with texture and uh, simple but highly effective juxtapositions of melodic material. However, to assimilate this learning, I thought I would do a bit of an experiment by creating an arrangement of London Bridge for the same orchestra used by Bizet, uh, using Farandola as a model as well, so taking the structure of it, the structural breakdown that I made last week, and applying London Bridge to that. In attempting to imitate Farandola, I realised I needed to compose the final section first. As we established in our analysis of Farandol, the melodic material was closely knit, with all the themes revealing their contrapuntal and linear relationship in the final section of the movement. To make sure the earlier material would match later material, I had to work backwards. Similar to Farandol, the use of London Bridge is reflective of its use of the pre-existing carol Le Marche de Ré, However, London Bridge is only eight bars in length, whereas Le Marche de Ré uh, had 16 bar, a pair of 16-bar melodies, resulting in a 32-bar theme, if you like. Um, therefore, I needed to you know, repeat and create a second section to complement London Bridge. Uh, to do this, I use motifs and inversions uh, to the contour of the first eight bars uh, to write a melody that was both different but felt connected. Once I'd established my two A melodies, A1 and A2, as I referred to them in the analysis of Farandola, uh, I could write counter melodies to them both, giving me my B1 and B2 themes. To do this, I imitated the rhythmic features of Farandol. Um, I did this primarily so that I could quickly imitate the smaller developments that Giru makes in uh, smaller parts of the work, where he alters and fragments motifs um, in the sort of final section and coda. Opening the door to melodic developments of my own would likely have led to the piece losing its identity, uh, diminishing the intended learning exercise, uh, the connection between the two pieces. It was also revealing to see, through the imitation process, the effectiveness of subtle melodic variation both musically as a listener and as a creator, making the writing process much more manageable in a short space of time. Once I had my material for the final section laid out, I then took the melodies and started to sketch material to match the textural schema that Farandol presents. So the introduction of my London Bridge arrangement uses both a homophonic chordal texture and then a two-part part canon in, in the introduction, just like Farandola. It was also only in doing this that I realised that I hadn't, done a, hadn't written or composed a homophonic texture uh, for quite some time. I don't seem to use that texture in my own writing, which was quite a, a nice discovery really, it's something I should probably try and use more often, think about texture a bit more in my writing. In exposing the beat themes, I then deploy a melody and accompaniment texture, similar to Giru does in Farandol. I also copy the orchestrational strategy that enables him to repeat the melodies over and over through this, through this section, the, if you recall the section that I highlighted in the previous um, video. Slowly building the intensity through, you know, gradually uh, adding players, it creates a, some variety and a build towards eventually a tutti. This kind of simple economy is something I often neglect in my orchestrations, so going through the process of imitating Giro's orchestration was hugely insightful. You can probably guess uh, by now that I copy the textural plan and orchestration quite closely. I used the same monophonic, homophonic and melody and accompaniment textures along with similar orchestral colours. I do this until the final section where I add an extra counter melody to the texture which really makes it more polyphonic in the table I put uh, melody, counter melody, counter melody but really probably should have put polyphon... polyphi... polyphony <laughs> But especially given the fact that I use like a pedal harmony through that as like a static accompaniment component. It's in the final section of the work where I indulge myself the most, uh, building to a coda where I place more fragmented motifs of the London Bridge melody than Giroud does of Le Marche de Ray. 
Uh, another place where I was able to eject some of myself uh, was in the like, smaller scale harmony, so the chords in the accompaniment to some of the B themes. I used some black like, modal mixed strength, things like that. Um, if I were to revise this piece, I think the thing I would change is not necessarily the harmony, because I you know, don't mind the harmony, it was just the voicing and how it's laid out for individual instruments in terms of possible double stops or divisi and things like that. Working to the same tonal schema as Giru uh, was insightful as well. Using closely related keys as the primary modus of melodic development was an efficient means of quickly varying the melodies in a way that refreshes them from the listener's perspective. Moreover, the larger scale minor to major switch of the London Bridge melody was again a simple but very expressive and effective device that could certainly have application in other arrangements and compositions. Uh, particularly for final movements of a multi-movement work or suite, which Farandollar is. Before evaluating the wider creative lessons learned from this process, it's probably worth now listening to my arrangement of London Bridge, uh, which is a similar length to Farandollar, is uh, between three and four minutes. In doing so, I've prepared a score to go alongside it, uh, which you can follow along with, and an accompanying chart that highlights any deviations I've made in red, and also highlights the similarities. Uh, obviously to realise my uh, arrangement of London Bridge, I've just used Note Performer here, which I personally really like as a piece of software.
and created my version of London Bridge for Orchestra. I took my analysis from last week of Farandola as the basis for my arrangement. Tracing that analysis, my structural breakdown very closely, it proved to be an incredibly fun learning exercise uh, as I was able to uh, create a complete piece of music quite quickly, you know, pick up useful compositional techniques that I can apply in future, uh, hopefully with greater freedom, greater originality. I want to summarise now with three lessons I've learned from using Farandola to create my version of London Bridge. The first of these lessons was the reaffirmation that musical ideas, or any idea for that matter, does not necessarily come linearly, and that we should not expect or believe that ideas, ideas do this. To compose a piece similar to Farandola, I had to figure out the finale of my arrangement first. I had to compose a melody to London Bridge, uh, an A2 melody, similar to uh, how Farandola has the full Le Marche de Ray, but breaks it in half. I had to do, the, do that the other way around, create two parts, another part to pre-existing first part. Then had to compose counter melodies for them two parts that could work together contrapuntally. Um, and they were obviously my B1 and B2 themes, which I refer to in the breakdown of Farandol. These materials could have then be broken up um, and adapted in the wider arrangement, uh, including their exposition earlier on in the piece. I had to start first with the ending and then go back to the beginning and middle sections. The second lesson was that writing counter melodies can be an efficient way of quickly doubling down on your melodic material. Constrained by your first melody, it, it constrains and channels your own creativity as the creative problem becomes not one of shall I, what melody shall I create, but I need to create a melody that works with this pre-existing one. If we think, I guess, about Renaissance polyphony, for example, composers use Cantus Fermi, which you know were often pre-existing melodies that they could then build uh, quite complex polyphonic compositions around. Using the rules of counterpoint, their freedom again was restricted, but you know it harnessed their creativity. In this instance, we could also use the rules of counterpoint or our subjective intuition to, t to determine whether you know the melodies sound nice together. Either way, the already existing theme gives us a creative heading. The third lesson is that thinking sectionally, or perhaps a little more rudimentary, is a useful device for composing uh, efficiently, quickly. Thinking about the juxtaposition or adaptation of sections as opposed to the creation and adaptation of, say, smaller units of music like a musical motif is inherently quicker as you have you are reiterating uh, portions of music that span more time. Uh, for instance, in composing just two 16-bar sections of music, you've got 32 bars worth of music like in Farandol. But then if you juxtapose those units interestingly, and say you do it four times, you've quickly got yourself to 128 bars of music. Using subtle orchestration changes again, like in Farandola, means that writing 128 bars of music will not have to take you very long either. What we create is not only under our control, but how we create it is as well. In summary, reflecting generally on the exercise as a whole, I found that simple infrequent developments to larger portions of music are not only easier to create, but can be just as effective from the listener's perspective as well. Farandol case in point. It's a short movement that, as we analyse, does uh, sections, repeat sections, does simple orchestration, but is an entertaining piece to listen to. It's a good end to the whole set of suites, the pair of suites. Essentially then, the overarching lesson it becomes one of strategy. As a composer, arranger, orchestrator, I guess, I know I do, but maybe more of us need to think about time a little more. Time as in um, how much music we have to create, and time as in how long we have to create that amount of music. I suppose then the sage wisdom of this uh, lesson becomes... If time is scarce and the musical requirements are large, then make it easy for yourself and emphasise simple, large-scale permutations. If time is plentiful and the musical requirements are smaller, then challenge yourself and explore complex permutations on multiple levels of the composition. If you've enjoyed this video, then subscribe, click that little bell icon, 
like and give us some feedback or questions below in the comments section. On the Any All Music website we also have the article version of this video. I've been George Marshall at Any All Music and I hope to see you again next time.